This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. Today we're going to be talking about one of your joints, and it's a joint you've already seen me use, but you may not have noticed. It's the shoulder. To get us through this complicated joint, but to make it simple, we have with us a world's expert, Dr. Matthew Monnier. Welcome. Dr. Monnier is a professor of orthopedics here at the University of California, San Diego, and he's director of the Upper Extremity Fellowship, including hand and upper extremity. So thank you for spending some time with us. Um, in preparation for the show, I saw data that said there's 9.7 million injuries each year to the shoulder and 33,000 shoulder replacements each year in the United, just in the United States alone. And that 10% of all Americans, if you, if you ask them over the last couple of months, will complain that they've had a shoulder problem. So it's not a little deal, it's a big deal. So shoulder issues, uh, as far as discomfort or pain related to the shoulder is second actually to low back pain. So low back pain, about 80 to 83% of people will have an episode at some point in their life. And something referable to the shoulder, 79 to 80% of people will have it at some point in their life. So it's very common to have pain associated with your shoulder. Now, that's not to say having an injury that requires an operation. It's just that you have discomfort and it makes it hurt for a while and it's hard to you know, get a gallon of milk out of the fridge or reach up and put something on a high shelf. The overwhelming majority of the time that will settle down on its own, but it can be kind of a nuisance and it's sort of a nagging, or a nagging issue that just makes it uncomfortable to do things. Well, I, and I want to get through that because there's going to be some ways that we can tell people that maybe they can help prevent that or what to do when it happens. But to me, to understand it, first we have to understand the shoulder. And I remember in medical school, the shoulder was one of those joints that it was sort of magical, mystical, that it actually worked and things didn't go wrong all the time. So can you take us through what the parts of the shoulder are and, and how it actually works? So the shoulder very broadly is a ball and socket joint, but the ball is gigantic and the socket is tiny. And so an analogy that a lot of people use is a tennis ball balanced on a golf tee. So you can do it, but the things that would keep it stable would be some way of taping the ball onto the golf tee or in the shoulder, it's the use of the muscles surrounding it which provide a lot of the stability. Along with, around every other joint, there's a, a structure called the capsule which is sort of the lining of the joint. And the capsule provides a lot of strength and integrity to the, st the stability of the shoulder joint. So basically it's a ball and socket with a very shallow socket and a really large ball which means that you have a tremendous range of motion, but it's also the most likely joint to get dislocated. Um, I, I told you before the show that I've had a couple operations on my shoulder, and you say dislocated, and I feel the pain without even thinking about it. It's automatic. And the, the range of motion, I'm just thinking about a kid throwing a ball, right? a, a natural event. The range of motion that takes you through, and, and the, the, the picture of the tennis ball and the golf tee, it's amazing it doesn't pop out. And my shoulder used to subluxate or pop out partially all the time and you know you're pushing it back or popping it back it's astonishing that this doesn't happen to everybody why why does it work what is it that's what are the muscles that are holding the shoulder there how do how do they actually sit around here and work so very broadly if the ball of the humerus is sort of like my fist there's four muscles that sit around the ball of the humerus there's one on top which is the supraspinatus there's another one that sort of comes up from the back, the infraspinatus, a th third one, the teres minor, and then there's another one in the front, the subscapularis. And all four of those muscles pulling together in a synchronized fashion basically drive the center of the ball toward the chest into the socket. And the phenomenon is what's called cavity compression. So they're compressing the ball into the socket and holding it there 
so that the deltoid, which is the big muscle of the shoulder, can provide power to raise the arm. And the easiest analogy to think of is if you've ever had to hold a flagpole or some other heavy long pole, you can hold it away from your body and it works, but it's heavy. But if you brace it against your, your pelvis or your waist and hold it halfway down, it's much easier to move it around because the base of it is stabilized. And so that's what the rotator cuff does. It stabilizes the head inside the joint so that the deltoid can move the rest of the arm around and position it in space. How big are those muscles? The rotator cuff muscles are fairly small. I mean, they're, they're very broad, but the architecture of them, the way that they're organized, is to provide small amounts of force rapidly throughout the course of the day. They're not endurance muscles. So while there's a lot of it, muscle bulk-wise, they're not really adapted to do much more than just activate very short periods of time and, and position the ball in the appropriate place. The real power of the shoulder is the deltoid. And so, and the deltoid is, if I'm throwing a ball, is what gives me my arm speed or makes it move quickly? The deltoid plus some of the other surrounding muscles. There's 17 total muscles that attach onto the scapula, so there's a lot of muscles that, that combine in sequence for the complex action of simply throwing a ball. But the deltoid and the latissimus, which is another big muscle, will help provide some of the power along with the pectoralis major, which is another big muscle in the front of the shoulder. So you have the little muscle stabilizing, you have some big muscles that surround it to move it in different directions. That means there are 17 different muscles that can have something go wrong, right? Yeah, broadly. <laughs> uh, and, and, and there's a capsule that can go wrong. Right. And can something happen to the joint itself or the, the you know, you have a ball and a socket, can something happen to those pieces as well? Right, so you mentioned that you'd had a dislocation in the past. And so one of the things that we see is that younger patients, so there was a famous study that was done through West Point and the advantage of using a place like the Military Academy is you have 4,000 people between the ages of 18 and 22 who are effectively captive. You can't lose them from follow-up. And you can see what happens. And so if they were under the age of 18 with their first traumatic dislocations, they were competing in sports, they were wrestlers, football players, they had an 80% chance at some point in having another instability episode if they were playing in a contact sport. If they weren't playing in a contact sport, it was down in the high 50s. As you get older, so after the age of about 30 to 35, that incidence drops to about 20%. So the first thing that can happen is if you have a traumatic dislocation, the capsule or the support structures of the joint can get torn. And so while anatomically, other than things being stripped off, everything's there, it just doesn't heal, so the joint is more unstable. You can also have fractures, which then to be more of a, a severe injury. And the ones that we see here more frequently are, are snowboarding injuries or skiing injuries. We also used to get a lot of the um, injuries from the desert, so people would wreck motorcycles or motocross bikes. Yeah. The economy seems to have slowed that down because no one's gonna go and spend three days in the desert burning a lot of gas, but you know that type of high energy injury is what leads to fractures surrounding the joint. So you can break the joint surface, you can break the joint surface of the socket, you can break it on the humerus, and then you can also break the, the actual shaft of the humerus, the supporting structure for the shoulder, all of which can have an impact on how the shoulder functions. So we've got tearing things, we've got breaking things. Um, sometimes they get inflamed? They can, yes. So the inflammation, a very specialized form of that is a phenomenon called adhesive capsulitis, which is most common in women between it, the ages of about 50 to 65. We don't understand what turns it on. Um, somehow the capsule, the lining of the joint gets inflamed and it can be very painful. So it's the kind of discomfort where it's hard to walk around, your shoulders just sort of has this burning, aching sensation. And over time it actually loses range of motions. So the capsule itself gets thicker and tighter and so patients end up losing the ability to raise their arm. Um, the first thing that actually ends up going is that they lose the ability to roll their arm out to the side. So it just becomes harder and harder to so roll So is that out. what people call frozen shoulder? That is colloquially frozen shoulder. Yeah, and, and so that's the kind of the worst form of inflammation. Then you have somebody who's doing the same job over and over or doing the same sport over and over. Do they get, they get inflammation as well? They can. It may not, I mean, it's probably an inflammatory component. Broadly, it's been termed uh, impingement or impingement syndrome. It's probably not an actual impingement in the sense of two bones pinching the soft tissue between them, but it's more a mechanical dysfunction of how the muscles are working. But the lining of the muscles can get inflamed and that can be very painful. So structurally the muscle's normal, 
but every time you're activating it, it's hurting. It's moving, it's, it's hurting. Um, and then you have people who get generalized inflammation through all their joints, arthritis or kind of things. Generally older, what, what happens to their joint? And so with the arthritis, there's two types generally of, of the arthritis. One is something which is an actual inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis patients will very frequently have a lot of joint destruction. The shoulder is very commonly involved. The problem with rheumatoid arthritis is it's going to affect the muscles, but the primary issue is it's the body attacking the joint surface, the cartilage surfaces. And so they end up with joint destruction. And really, the most definitive treatment is ultimately going to be a form of a joint replacement. So, so the ball socket is the problem. It's not the muscles around it. It's right there. Right. Very late, they end up with muscle problems because it's really a problem with the bone. But yeah, basically, the cartilage surface gets eaten away by the body. And, and that's a generalized arthritis problem. Um, the other type is the osteoarthritis, or sort of degenerative arthritis. Um, and then that is a wear and tear phenomenon, generally, of the cartilage. And then the final type of arthritis, which is one that's becoming a little bit more prominent recently, is an arthritis of the shoulder related to a chronic rotator cuff tear. And that's related to an alteration in the mechanical function of the shoulder because you lose the normal mechanics. And so the ball is sliding around more than it should inside the socket. And so then it gets worn out because the mechanics are altered. Got it. So we've kind of taken ourselves through how the shoulder really works and then what can go wrong with it. Now let's talk about what happens to people, I mean, what, what they notice. When, when somebody starts to have their shoulder bother them, what are the kind of symptoms that they notice? Uh, and then I'm gonna eventually ask you, what are we gonna have them do about it? But what are the, what are the kinds of symptoms that people get in their shoulder? So the, the hardest part about symptoms around the shoulder is it's generally maddeningly vague. The most classic complaint is sort of a stabbing pain outside portion of the arm generally about five to six inches below the shoulder. So sort of a stabbing pain in this area, it just aches. And that's that kind of classic pain. People notice it when they're driving, it wakes them up from sleeping. It may or may not bother them all the time. It may get better if they've warmed up. Um, you know, you reach to try and put something on a high shelf and you just get that kind of sharp discomfort. That's classic for rotator cuff symptoms. Even though the pain itself feels very local, it doesn't necessarily correlate with whether or not you have a tear or just inflammation of the shoulder, and it doesn't correlate with where in the shoulder the pathology is occurring. It's so just, it's... The same complaint could come from a whole host of, of things, sources. Right. And that becomes somebody's job to figure it out. Right. All right so you don't want, uh, it's not appropriate for everybody who gets this uh, right. to come running to you. So when, when they have that moment, and assuming it's not repetitively, constantly, chronically bothering them, but it comes up, what do they do? So the first thing is, as with the vast majority of musculoskeletal injuries, unless you've had a, a trauma. And so this is one of the things that, you know, all this stuff is, is somewhat predicated on history. You know, if you're 18 years old and started having shoulder pain following getting tackled in the football game, and you know, you had a stinger and it was hard to raise your arm for a day or two, and then it's now this aching sensation, that needs to be evaluated much more than someone who's in their mid thirties and hasn't really done anything, has just started hurting. You know, again, if you're in your mid-60s and fell down the stairs and have this same complaint, then, you know, again, it needs to be evaluated because the odds of something bad happening have started to go up. But if it really is just, I woke up one day, I don't know what I did, it just started aching, the majority of things will go away with rest and activity modification. Icing can always be helpful. Ibuprofen, under the supervision of a primary care doctor, can be helpful. But if you've done all of those things, the next step generally that we use is a course of physical therapy. And what the therapy is doing is it's just helping to kind of rebalance the muscles around the shoulder. So it's allowing the other muscles to get stronger, it gives the injured muscle a chance to recover uh, and rehabilitate itself. And is the assumption that the physical therapist is qualified to be able to say, you know what, this is more. This is something I, I think you need to see an orthopedist for. Right. So in California, the therapists can't see patients without a physician's order. So it's going to have to have gone through a physician of some time, some, sorry, of some kind. But the vast majority of the primary care physicians are going to be somewhat well versed in, in broader shoulder complaints. This is not something that they've never seen before. Um, but the therapist, yes, the therapist will have an understanding of the mechanics and they, sh they have a sense of how things should progress. And if it's just a straightforward inflammation of the tendon, it should settle down. Generally, the time horizon we use is six to 12 weeks. 
If it hasn't gotten better at that point, then it probably should be evaluated more. Got it. So, uh, and if it's evaluated more, it eventually comes to an orthopedist. You're a specialist and you're a super specialist and you're at a university, but orthopedists are trained to do this. Right. General orthopedists are trained to do this. When do you go to a general orthopedist? When do you go to a super specialist? You know, how, how does someone know where to go? So again, the shoulder, the vast majority of the shoulder issues are going to be able to be taken care of by a general orthopedist. Um, so if someone is a generalist, they'll have a familiarity with the majority of things that are going on. Um, you know, 15 years ago, they may have been able to specialize in arthroscopic repairs versus open repairs. Currently, with the way training has gone, pretty much anybody who's doing shoulder work at this point is going to be able to do it either completely arthroscopically or what's called a mini open. So the majority is arthroscopic, and then they make a small incision. And statistically, when that's been looked at, there's no difference in outcome between an entirely arthroscopic repair and a mini open repair. So it doesn't really matter if you're doing it one way or the other. The formal open repairs do have a worse outcome, and that's related to detachment of the deltoid muscle. So there's more dissection that's done, so it's harder to recover. Um, so if you're going to any of the orthopedists in town, then they should be able to handle it fine. The things that we look at are, one, was there a traumatic history? Two, the age of the patient. You know, If you're in your 40s and have a rotator cuff problem without trauma, it's far less likely that you're going to have a rotator cuff tear. If you're in your 60s, the odds of a rotator cuff tear, even though there may be no trauma, start to climb. Um, and there was a study that was done a number of years ago looking at MRI, where they just MRI'd a number of people around the age of 45, around the age of 55, and around the age of 65. And at 45, about half of people had changes in the signal of the tendon. So the tendon still looks normal. If you actually opened it up and looked at it, it would look fine. But the MRI is looking and seeing that there's changes in the architecture of it. At 55, about half of people started to have evidence of a partial thickness tear. So there's actually damage to the, where the fibers stick down on the bone. And at 65, half of people had either a partial or a full thickness tear. So the tendon has actually torn off the bone. But interestingly, only 15% of them were symptomatic. So 85% of people had a full thickness tear and had no idea that they had a tear. How interesting. They've modified their activity in some way that it doesn't Yeah, come I mean, it didn't, didn't really affect them that much. And what that means is that you know, evolutionarily, 200 years ago, we all died when we were 45. So we didn't really need to be that much more durable. And so... Well, does it also mean if I'm 65 and somebody does an MRI on my shoulder and they find this tear, that they have to repair it? I mean, does everything that you find have to be fixed? Right. And so that's the other side of it is that if you get an MRI and have a rotator cuff tear and are completely asymptomatic, as a surgeon, I'm not going to make you better than that. Now, if you're 45 and have a tear and are completely asymptomatic, what you're hoping is that your shoulder with a rotator cuff tear is going to survive 30 to 40 years without getting worse. And so we alluded to this earlier with the arthritis related to a chronic rotator cuff tear. And so if you're 45, the odds are that at some point in your lifetime, the shoulder's gonna wear out and become dysfunctional. If you're 65 or 75 and have no pain, you're able to do the things that you want and have a rotator cuff tear, the odds of a surgeon making you better symptomatically are very low, and the protective effect is much less because it's not as likely that you're gonna wear out the shoulder over the remainder of your lifetime. So there's some significant judgment that's going on here about when to intervene and when not to intervene. Is everything that's shoulder pain related to the shoulder? Or are there pains that come up in this area that really are telling a doctor, wait, there's something else wrong elsewhere in the body? The, the classic one that goes along with shoulder pain is, is related to neck arthritis. So there's a lot of people who can have pain complaints around the shoulder or the shoulder girdle who particularly if they have sort of a comparatively normal exam. So you may have some weakness. We get an MRI or an ultrasound. The rotator cuff's completely intact. At that point, looking at the cervical spine where the nerves come out of the neck is, is something that's critical because you can have pressure on the nerves, which will create symptoms in the shoulder that has nothing to do with the actual structures surrounding the shoulder. Um, that's probably the biggest one that would refer it. Uh, the other one, classically, which causes pain radiating out the arm, particularly the left arm, would be cardiac issues. Um, so if you're having pain that's exertional that only goes down the left arm, 
probably should be evaluated. Something you should think about. So, um, I, you know, I'm a weekend warrior. I help coach my kids' teams. I was talking to one of the other dads the other day about how when we throw a ball, it's not the same as it used to be. T take us through from the time that you're young, that the proper way that you should use your shoulder, how to prevent a problem, to the time when you're getting old and, you know, only on the weekends do you pick up a ball. How do we, how do we not get into trouble? So as with a, a lot of things, conditioning is really what matters. Um, when I was a resident, we took care of professional athletes through the residency where I was uh, training. And the therapists used to always have a, a joke that they would tease the, generally it was the professional pitchers that would come through. They would tease them that they could give them a five pound weight and in five minutes they could have these guys begging to stop. And everyone would take the bet because, you know, they're young and immortal and they figure that nothing with five pounds can be done. How bad could it be? And the thing is that the rotator cuff muscles, which are adapted for short firing bursts, or not endurance muscles, even with a five pound weight in someone who throws stuff for a living, you can get them very tired very quickly so that it hurts. Now, these are people who spend a lot of time building up the endurance so that they can throw a baseball 120 times a day and, and do it as, as hard as they can. As we get older, we generally don't maintain that level of conditioning. And so when I was rehabbing, they gave me a can of soup. Right. I mean, I, I felt like, a, you know, are you kidding me? Really? A can of soup? And that's what I use to do my exercises for the rotator cuff. Right. And I thought I, I must be the weakest guy in the entire world. Um, I feel better now that you told me about the five pounder. There, there's a famous video, it may even be on YouTube, of Roger Clemens when he was still pitching, training. And all of his rotator cuff stuff was done with a 10 to 12 pound weight. Wow. Wow. So little exercises go a long way. Right. So the, the kid who's playing tennis uh, and he's 14 years old, um, just go and play or they should be doing something to protect his shoulder? You know, people at that age, you know, and again, you know, you start to get into demographics. I mean, there's the increasing specialization in sports. I mean, when we were kids, I grew up on the East Coast, so we had a winter season. So you played everything. You played everything, and you had an enforced period of rest because you couldn't play everything year round. You know, with indoor leagues and indoor tennis and indoor soccer and living in Southern California, you know, I mean, the baseball season here is 12 months. The soccer season here is 12 months. The football season here is roughly 12 months. I mean, there's there's less of that play a bunch of different things and use different parts of your body and get used to moving in different ways. Um, so that if you're someone who is single sport specific at a very young age, what you have to protect against is getting somewhat unbalanced. So, you know, the muscles that allow you to serve a tennis ball really get really strong. The other muscles that you're not using for that don't as much. And that's where you start to run into problems. And so, that's where the, the rotator cuff rehabilitation programs can be helpful. And really all they're doing is they're, they're strengthening all of the little muscles around the shoulder so that they're not going to get overused. Somebody playing that much, you hope, has a good athletic trainer or coach that understands this? We'd hope so. Uh, um, I'm not sure where it is right now. There's a movement afoot to try and get a trainer at every interscholastic sports event in California. Um, more probably for the head injury component of it but also for a lot of the other injuries. I mean, the, the mechanics of, of injuries that occur can obviously have impact farther and farther and, along. And then for the 40, 50, 60 year olds, what are they doing to protect their shoulders or to prevent the problem? <clears throat> and so that's where the weekend warrior thing comes from. You know, the 14 year old who's overplaying at least is playing a lot. The problem is, is we get busier and have jobs and things that you do. You know, the older I get, the better I was. You know, I, you know when I was 20, I could do this. So, you know, I'll warm up a little bit and I can still do it. And the muscles, the speed of contraction decreases, the stiffness of the tendons goes up, the strength of the connection to the bone decreases. Um, you know, the, the classic one for the 45 year old is the Achilles tendon rupture playing basketball. It's someone who remembers that they were playing, they've warmed up, and there's that sudden acceleration and the tendon can't handle it. And it's similar in the rotator cuff. Um, you know, you've been throwing the ball with the kids for a while and, and you're going to show off and see if you can air it out and I'm going to throw it for 45 yards because I could when I was 18. And that's, <laughs> that's where it hurts. There it goes, right. So, so staying in shape and is still the right answer. God, it seems like everybody should see a physical therapist once a year just to check to see if anything's going wrong. You know, I mean, the, the thing on the exercises, not, there's nothing magical about the exercises. And there's, there's a, if you have access to the internet, there's a tremendous volume of information about what needs to be done. 
Um, the vast majority of it is small rotator cuff strengthening exercises. Um, and then the other part of it is making sure that it's the core strengthening. Um, you know, you can spend all your time lifting with your arms as much as possible. Uh, but if the body, the core, isn't going to be strong, you're not going to be able to generate enough force to throw something in the way that you're going to want to. And so then, if you are trying to, trying to throw with speed and accuracy, you're trying to hit the tennis ball as hard as possible, or you know, you're trying to surf, then what you do is you start to become dependent on arm strength to generate power rather than core strength to generate power. So we have like a minute or so left. It, what's coming down the pipeline? that people ought to know about for shoulders that may make a big difference for them or a difference for you in the operating room or ways to get people back to their, what they're gonna do? Well, the, the newest things coming down the pipeline, the hardest part that we have right now is that if you look just at the technology, particularly for things like rotator cuff repairs, our technology is we identify the tendon, we try and make it as good as possible for healing, and then we sew it into the bone and we're dependent on the body to heal the tendon back. The next steps are trying to manipulate that efficacy of healing, trying to, to alter how things heal to bone so that it heals faster, it heals more securely, it heals more like it was prior to being injured. Um, as far as replacement goes, that's a harder issue. It's not just like we resurface it with cartilage because there's been alterations in the anatomic structures of the shoulder and there's derangements in how the shoulder moves. There's obviously changes that are happening in bearing surfaces and the fixation of bearing surfaces. But the most important thing is going to be altering how we can identify injuries earlier and improve the healing of tendon back to bone or the labrum, the soft tissue back to bone to ensure that it becomes a durable repair. Well, thank you. I'm so glad you're out there taking care of all this and, and working on it. And I'm glad you had a few minutes to spend with us to talk about all this. We always say this on Health Matters, that knowledge is power. And I think you heard again why you need to be involved in your own medical care, your own body's health. If you stay in shape, you're careful about making sure that everything is working right, and you're smart about how you do things, you can help at least stave off much of this. If you have a problem, start with your primary care doctor and then work your way up if you need to. So listen carefully, and I hope everyone was. Get out now and start doing your shoulder exercises. I'm Dr. David Granite. We'll see you again next time right here on Health Matters.